So on Freedom Alternative, we do as we say. So I said I'll go to Georgia through Budapest, and here we are in Budapest. The reason for this move was simple. It was cheaper to go through Budapest. With the same money I would have spent flying directly to Tbilisi from Bucharest, you get to see the Hungarian capital and the city of Kutaisi in Georgia. It is hard for me to look at Budapest as a place to explore, study and dissect on this channel because I'm too familiar with the city and I treat visits here pretty much like I treat visits to Chernivtsi, Kiev or Bucharest for that matter. It's a familiar place where I just have to sometimes go for various purposes, either in transit or for business. Anyway, this time I'll try my best to treat Budapest differently, so with that said, let's explore! Hello everyone and welcome to the first featured installment of the Hungary-Georgia-Armenia tour. Uh, Budapest, one of the most densely populated cities in Europe and, if you include the suburbs, the home of roughly a third of Hungary's population. Budapest is a place that is accustomed to being relevant and rich. Geography helps a lot, of course, but this place was built to be a capital and a significant regional pillar, something which is not always true with European capitals. With a GDP per capita adjusted for PPP at 150% of European Union average, with a constant presence in innovation cities top 100 and with numerous UNESCO sites, some of it which you will be seeing in the next hour, Budapest is, for all intents and purposes, a global city. With that said, touring Budapest for the purposes of this video also came with two big frustrations, namely the ban on filming inside the House of Terror and the Hospital in Rock Museum. I can't even begin to describe how furious I was in the first day in Budapest after realizing that I had viewed two awesome places with nothing to show for. Now, although the House of Terror Museum is, in my opinion, less impressive in terms of complexity than the Sigeto Marmati Memorial, it is still worth visiting for the rich collection of propaganda footage that you get to watch inside. That was something I really wanted to capture on camera. You get to see footage from Imre Nog's show trial, the declassified footage done by the KGB days and weeks after the defeat of the 1956 revolution, and of course, lots and lots of footage made by the Communist Party with the purposes of propaganda. In my humble opinion, all of that should be in the public domain. Similarly, the Hospital in the Rock Museum, or Cyclokorha's Atombunker Museum, is, as the name says, a hospital inside a huge rock. But it's more than that, it's the hospital that was the only place still running during the siege of Budapest in World War II and also during the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. After that, the communist authorities expanded it into a subatomic facility and although the whole project was de facto decommissioned in early 1990s and the whole place declassified later on and turned into a museum in 2008, the restriction on videotaping still does remain, which again is sad because inside you have accurate representations on how surgeries were being conducted during the siege and also you get to look through the previously secret ventilation system and how the whole facility was basically erased from public conscience. Nobody knew the facility even existed after 1957. Everyone thought it had been destroyed during the fire. So yeah, these are the kind of places that should really allow videotaping inside, but until they do, 
you'll have to trust my word that they're totally worth visiting if you are in Budapest. So with that out of the way, let's go to the first place that does allow videotaping inside, namely the Military History Museum located on the Castle Hill close to the former Moscow Plaza, nowadays called Sale Kalwante. It's one of the places that is not rife with tourists and part of the reason is that there are these stairs. And although in theory you could avoid climbing them, in practice no one really knows for sure what bus and from where one can take, so you have to climb them. At 48 degrees Celsius, or maybe 46, anyway, it was warm <laughs> when I climbed them. But stairs aside, the place is really impressive, way above my expectations. At the entrance, we're welcomed with a few copies, but uh, also several original cannons used during uh, the 1848-49 revolution, a wave of revolutions that occurred on most of continental Europe, and a period that is called by historians the period of national awakening, which is particularly true for Eastern Europe, as most countries of the Intermarium can trace the beginning of their modern period back to the events of 1848 and 1849. Like most museums of this kind, this one is actually a bit more than a review of weaponry used by the country's military. In this museum, the visitor is invited to transpose himself into the mind and position of a soldier. In several exhibition rooms, you get to see uh, the very well done reconstructions of how the artifacts exhibited were actually used during the conflict, be it on the battlefield, in the trenches, in private homes, turned into front lines, or while defending or using a piece of infrastructure such as railways. 
Of course, one may argue that the depictions are imperfect, but it does the job of explaining visually to the visitor at least some of the realities of war. Sadly, only a tiny portion of the World War II section was open to the public as the permanent exhibition is going through a process of upgrading as it was explained to me. Hopefully they will upgrade it in a similar fashion because these types of setting of putting the artifacts in context as much as possible really is something I'd like to see more museums of this kind doing. In the inside yard of the museum, there is less order. We get to see more weaponry from the 1848 revolution, but also 17th century weaponry from the anti-Ottoman uprising, which sort of makes sense since right next to the museum there is the Abdurrahman Abdi Arnaud Pasha memorial, which is a grave with a turban of the last Turkish Ottoman governor of Budapest before the Ottoman rule was finally defeated. As I'm sure many of you know, Hungary was part of Dar al-Islam for a while, unlike Transylvania, Moldova, Wallachia and parts of what we now call Western Ukraine, which fell under a special category called Dar al ahdi or the House of Treaty. Eh, long story on that. Now. Contrary to what you'll hear from both the hardliners of the far left, who will tell you that Hungary is a fascist country that promotes militant fascism, or the hardliners of the out-right, who will agree, at least when it comes to government policy reflected in museums, and let's face it, governments always tweak the museums to tell their story, this simply did not appear to be the case. For instance, the event emphasized the most in the House of Terror, this museum of military history and also the next landmark, which I'll show you in a minute, was the 1956 Hungarian anti-communist revolution. They could have picked any other event, but they didn't. 
because contrary to what actual extremists would say, the Hungarian state is much less concerned these days with rekindling conflicts with its neighbors and much more concerned with common threats, communism and its various forms being chief among them. Speaking of the next landmark, let's head towards the place that I've been looking forward to go for two years now and never had the chance to, Memento Park. Part of the reasons I always missed this is because getting here is not very straightforward. One has to first take the Metro Line M4 till its end station at Kellenfeldi Pajotvar or Kellenfeld Railway Station and from there you have to take a bus that goes outside of Budapest. Sounds complicated, but it really isn't. It's just a bit of a long journey from the city center unless you're willing to wake up early and take some private buses that take you straight from downtown to this place. Memento Park is located right after the exit from Budapest and at the entrance, uh, entrance of the next locality called Budapest. Once you get here, you get to travel back in time, but in an orderly fashion. <laughs> In full fairness, this is a place that Americans should visit to take cues on what to do with their Confederate-era statues. It could definitely serve as a much better compromise than anything we've been able to see so far. The Memento Park is unique in the Intervarium because everywhere else these monuments were either destroyed outright or simply left to enter into decay by themselves and eventually removed when nobody even remembered they existed. Or a third solution, they were sold to Bulgaria. In Sofia, there are, they have a private museum of communist era statues and other propaganda monuments that they bought for pennies from all over the former Eastern Bloc. One day I'll take you to that one too. Anyway, the Memento Park is divided into two sections, the Statue Park, officially named A Sentence About Tyranny, and Witness Square, which can be visited without pay and portions of it are still under construction. The Witness Square is dominated by this monument, Stalin's Boots. In fact, the motto of the park is In the Shadow of Stalin's Boots. Like all other monuments in this ensemble, this makes sense if someone takes the time to tell you the story because otherwise the descriptions on the monuments themselves is either missing or very brief, almost too brief. The story of T Stalin's boots dates back to the failed 1956 anti-communist revolution when the revolutionaries tried and succeeded through primitive or ad hoc means to tear down a statue of Stalin. The boots were all that were left of it after they successfully pulled it down. Now this is a replica because the original statue was slightly smaller, but the boots of Stalin remain the symbol of the anti-communist struggle in Hungary after the failed attempt of 1956 to topple the Bolshevik regime. When this part of the park will be finished, more statues will be contextualized, but for now the visitor can explore uh, the inside of the monument and spot the Lenins, and there are a lot of Lenin's busts in it. <laughs> On the north side of the Witness Square, there is a barrack which can also be visited without pay. Inside the barrack, there are more boots of Stalin and the movie theater where you can watch footage made by the Hungarian version of the KGB, the Alomvédelmi Hatóság or the State Protection Authority. I've already shown you some of it in the bonus video I posted on this channel on August the 20th. Now, depending on your feedback, I may or may not come back with a separate video on Memento Park to tell you the detailed story of almost every artifact, but I have to include in this video this piece. It looks like a phone booth and it's a very fair reconstruction of how the old era taxophones used to look like. 
Instead of a phone book, though, it has a series of cards with questions such as when did Comrade Lenin assume office, or when was Nikolai Ceausescu executed, and if you dial the correct answer on the phone, you get to hear a speech by that particular communist leader. The entrance in the statute park is very light-hearted, and it comes with this attitude of mocking communism into oblivion, which in many ways makes sense, after all, if not for the tens of uh, millions of people killed and hundreds of millions of lives ruined, communism would be funny. It's so insane that it's essentially laughable. And this is true with many forms of evil, if not for the victims, most forms of evil are legitimately funny but more on that in a future video. I'll let you now enjoy some of more socialist realist monuments on appropriate sound background. Right? Now that we saw how Budapest commemorates the oppression by the international socialists, let's hit the road to see how Budapest commemorates the oppression exerted by the other socialists, the national socialists, that is. Thank you. 
The visit to the Holocaust Memorial Center started with a very sad setup. I had to go through a metal detector and a bag search. Why? Because, as the guard told me, the administration deemed it necessary after the entrance had been vandalized by the progress and diversity called in by Angela Merkel, who ravaged many portions of Budapest at the height of the so-called refugee crisis in late 2015. I specifically asked several times if they ever had threats or actual violence from neo-Nazis or other local groups. The guards were clear. Nope. There are actual fascists in Hungary, but they just talk trash on the internet. The violence is Islamic and distinctly non-white. I were to soon be greeted with less severe but still non-zero amount of control in the Kutaisi synagogue. What a demented world we live in. Anyway, after the control, I got uh, the good news. Entrance was free in that day and videotaping was allowed everywhere. They even had an indoor smoking area and cheap and fantastic coffee. Now, speaking of coffee, something that looked to me bizarre, but it is otherwise normative in Hungary, all museums have a cavezo or a coffee shop. Bizarre and weird, but hey, I was tired and needed a coffee, so there's that. Inside the museum, I kept on asking myself why would anyone attack this place violently, because unlike many other establishments of this kind, this one is really modest and although primarily focused on the national socialist oppression of Jews, it also covers the religious-based prosecutions of Jehovah's Witnesses, Evangelical Christians and Catholics. While progressives will tell you that fascists were very fond of religion, the realities of fascism under Miklos Horthy in Hungary tell a slightly different story. But the reason the persecution of Jews gets a lot of attention in Hungary is because on a per capita basis, Hungary was actually more active than Nazi Germany itself in terms of rounding up its Jews. Before 1938, Jews were 5% of the Hungarian population and 23% of Budapest's population. This explains why the largest synagogue in Europe, and also the second largest in the world, was, and still is, located in Budapest on Dohan Street. Today, Jews are less than 1% of the Hungarian population and at least 400,000 Jews perished during the Holocaust. For a country that small, this makes Hungary more active than Nazi Germany itself on a per capita basis. This was possible due to many factors. For starters, Jews remained the only visible minority after the conclusion of World War I and the Trianon Treaty. The Serbs, the Slovaks, the Romanians, the Slovenes and other minorities became almost non-existent after the territories on which these peoples lived were given to their countries. Secondly, the Jews were, of course, successful, which means they were already a target for any socialist government, so it comes as no surprise that the National Socialist Administration targeted them. And it all started with what nowadays political ignorant uh, leftists and other helicopterables would call progressive policies. For instance, the Hungarian government passed a bill in 1920 instituting a Jewish quota in universities, saying that 5% of the students needed to be Jewish in order to reflect their population. Jews tended to be between 30 and 50% of the student body. It is a policy that is still being used today in many so-called civilized and enlightened countries, this time uh, targeting men as a whole, or sometimes only white men. Admiral Miklos Horthy, like the socialists of today, believed in equality of outcome and reality insisted on contradicting him. And like the socialists of today and of anywhere else on the planet, he thought that reality must be wrong and corrected. By force, if necessary. The total number of victims among Jews was also exacerbated by two factors. One is that the Nazis themselves believed Horthy wasn't doing enough on the so-called Jewish question, so they invaded and dealt with it themselves from one point on. And another factor is that many individuals, although warned that deportations and exterminations will come, chose to ignore the warning. Yad Vashim, the International School for Holocaust Studies, notes uh, in an interview with Dr. Götz Ali, German historian and journalist, that, quote, the Hungarian Jews in 1944 knew all about it. They had a lot of information because there were Jewish refugees coming to Hungary in 1942 and 43, giving reports about what was happening in Poland. 
And what was the reaction from the, the Jews? Well, this is Hungary, this might be happening in Galicia to Polish Jews, but this can't happen in our very cultivated Hungarian state. It is impossible that even early in 1944 the Jewish leadership there didn't have some information about what was happening. There were people escaping from the extermination camps just 80 kilometers from the Hungarian border and there were letters and reports and of course the BBC. Part of the problem of the Holocaust was the potential victims couldn't believe the information." Unquote. This sentiment is similar to what Austrian Jews had believed even as the Anschluss or the annexation of Austria to Nazi Germany was taking place.
Before finishing the tour through this memorial, which comes with a lot of reading material and footage, one gets to go out through the Pava Street Synagogue, which is linked to the main building of the museum. This synagogue used to be the second largest place of Jewish worship in Budapest and it is nowadays used for research purposes. Built in 1923, right as the state-sponsored Jew hatred was warming up in Hungary, the Pazza Street uh, synagogue is discreet and unobtrusive. You almost don't notice from the outside that there is a synagogue there. At the exit, I wrote in the guest book exactly how I felt. Collectivism is a cancer upon normal people. Because it is. Alright, enough with the very ugly past, let's go to the slightly less ugly but still troubled past that is also pleasing to the eye. So let's hit the road downtown to the Koshut Liar Square, where the building of the parliament is located. The Hungarian parliament, or the Országhoz, is a notable landmark in Budapest. In fact, it is quite hard to miss it as it is still the tallest building in Budapest and the largest building in both historical and present-day Hungary. But in addition to being huge, this parliament building is also very aesthetically pleasing both from the inside and from the outside. Built in the Gothic Revival style between 1885 and 1904, the building has a symmetrical facade and a central dome. Now, sadly, videotaping inside the central dome is, as many things in Hungary, forbidden. Which is a pity, because that's the best spot inside the building where one can really see just how tall this place is. With that said, the place is rife with symbols. For instance, the building is 96 meters long and the many lights are placed at exactly 96 centimeters from the ceiling. The number 96 refers to the conquest of what was later on to become Kingdom of Hungary in 896 Anno Domini, as well as the country's 1000th anniversary in 1896, when the building was supposed to be used for the first time. Now, although the building was inaugurated in 1896, it was completed in 1904 and portions of it only started being used in 1898, but that's just details. In addition to the many luxurious hallways, the coolest thing is these many cigar holders. According to the guide, parliamentarians used to smoke expensive cigars and sometimes they would let one lit there and went back into uh, the room to attend the sessions. And if one cigar were burned out entirely while the owner was inside listening to the speech, that meant the speech was very good or, as they would put it, a speech totally worth a Havana. <laughs> 
Nowadays, the building is, at best, a neutral existence, namely that tourists pay for its continuous and expensive renovation and upkeep. That is, at best. At worst, it's a budget drain. Maintaining it is very expensive, even though it is gorgeous, and part of that is because only a tiny portion of the building is actually being used for its intended purpose. Most of it is closed entirely, both for tourists and for the parliamentarians and the employees of the building. At the end of the tour, there is an exhibition with the objects that used to be inside the building or on top of it, but that have since been removed. Above them is the Red Star, which had been perched on the top of the dome during the period of the People's Republic of Hungary. The Red Star was removed in 1990. Also inside the building, there is the Museum of the Parliament, recently reopened with the exhibition titled 1000 Years of Hungarian Legislation. Entrance in this part of the building is free of charge and videotaping is allowed. It doesn't have too many things worth including in this presentation, but it is a portion that you should not miss if you're in Budapest, because it's a good opportunity to learn about how the history of Hungary was seen from basically from inside this building, or generally from inside the Hungarian aristocracy. One particularly interesting item is the footage from the 1912 assassination attempt of István Tisza, a chap that was really disliked in Hungarian politics at the time. He survived three assassination attempts and this is the first of them when an opposition member of the parliament shot at him while he was holding a speech in that parliament. The shooter was arrested by, uh, but later on released on temporary insanity grounds. Goes to show how tough politics used to be 100 years ago. Nowadays we have international whining because a politician said pussy on TV. Anyway, this particular small museum does live up to the name as it has artifacts from the 10th century all the way up to late 1990s and really does bring a solid view of how the history of Hungary was viewed from the point of view of the legislators. In the immediate vicinity of the parliament building, facing the Danube, there is also the memorial called simply Shoes on the Danube Bank, because, well, it does depict shoes on the Danube Bank. The shoes are meant to commemorate the victims of the January 1945 reprisals when about 1,000 people were asked to take off their shoes and walk towards the edge of the promenade so as their bodies would fall into the river and be taken away after they were shot. And in groups of about 100, on January 8, 1945, the Arrow Cross Execution Brigade shot all the inhabitants of various safe houses that they could find. Several other ex smaller executions took place in the same fashion in a spot nearby throughout 1944. In total, around 3,500 people were executed in this fashion. All of them civilians who happened to be of the wrong religion or had friends of the wrong nationality or simply were not excited enough with the national socialist flavor of totalitarianism. Within walking distance uh, from the Kossuth Lyer Square and, uh, and the Parliament, there is the Liberty Square, or Sabajog there, where in addition to admiring the classy architecture of the building that now serves as the National Bank of Hungary, one also gets to admire several controversial monuments. And no punches are being pulled since there is something in this square to piss off everyone. First, there is the statue of Ronald Reagan, which triggered the poor leftist soul right after I videotaped these images that you're looking at now. Then there is the bust of Miklos Horthy, the Hungarian fascist responsible with the anti-Semitic laws, several tens of thousands of murders and other deeds of similar fashion. 
Then there is the so-called Monument of German Occupation, which, if you ask the civil activists, it's the most controversial one because it allegedly denies the Hungarian involvement in the Holocaust. And then, of course, there is also the only Soviet monument still standing in Budapest. And above all of these, there is the American Embassy. <laughs> But no, seriously, this square has something for everyone and that means it's always full of tourists. Getting a clean shot of each and one of them took a lot of patience. Now, I mentioned earlier that Budapest is home to the biggest synagogue in Europe. Well, this is the place. Sadly, in addition to being quite expensive to visit, all the guided tours for that evening were already sold out and I was risking missing my flight to Georgia if I were to come back the next day, so I made a snap judgment of skipping this landmark for this tour. But, as I said in the beginning of this video, I go to Budapest very often, so if there will be demand, I'll make sure to drop by next time I'm in Budapest. Now, you haven't been to Budapest if you haven't looked over the city from the towers of St. Istvan Basilica, or St. Stephen's Basilica, the Roman Catholic Basilica named in honor of the first King of Hungary. Although it is not the biggest church in Hungary, but only the third largest one, it is the most important church building in the country and it is 96 meters tall. There is that number again. By the way, it is forbidden in Budapest to build anything taller than 96 meters. That's how seriously Hungarians take their symbolism for the number 96. The building of this church took 54 years to build and it was completed in 1905. The only impressive part of the church that cannot be easily accessed by the tourists is the so-called Great St. Istvan Bell, located in the southern tower. I've asked around how to get to it and although nobody from the staff told me it's forbidden to go there, nobody could explain how to get uh, there either. Too bad. That bell is impressive though, it's uh, through its dimensions and weight. 240 centimeters in diameter and weighs 9,250 kilograms. It is used usually twice a year, once at 5 p.m. on Constitution Day and once at midnight on New Year's Eve. Now, if you remember the videos from last year's Ukraine tour, you'll know what I'm going to say. The Catholics really know how to church. When it comes to churches that are both big and impressive, the Catholics win, hands down. Now, unlike the Greek Catholic Cathedral in Lviv, where I had to climb an enormous amount of stairs to get to the top of the dome to get those nice 360 images, this church comes with elevators. Admittedly, tiny and unfriendly, but hey, better than climbing over 350 stairs. All in all, Budapest is a really cute city. But, as I said in the intro, it's a bit weird for me to look at it as a place to visit, as Budapest is far more like a place for business and also for transit towards another destination. Pretty much like Bucharest, really. Except Budapest didn't have a megalomania communist in it, so most of its cute places did survive the commie insanity much better than the ones in Bucharest. Speaking of cuteness, before I headed towards the airport and board the flight to Georgia, I couldn't resist the temptation to make another visit to the center of cuteness, otherwise known as the Cat Cafe. Since my last visit here, back in 2014, they have introduced a tax of 500 forints per hour if you're gonna get in here to only pat the cats without drinking anything. <laughs> now, I can't blame them, after all, patting the cat is expensive.
Anyway, in conclusion, Budapest has made tremendous progress in terms of becoming tourist-friendly. Back in 2014 and in 2015, in my previous visits, English was almost entirely foreign and Hungarian language skills were pretty much mandatory if you couldn't afford paying exorbitant fees to get an English language guided tour for everything. Now, I almost never had to try to speak Hungarian, which is an incredibly difficult language that even the natives tend to forget if they don't speak it for a year or two. And I had not spoken Hungarian for two years prior to this tour. But, as I were to soon find out, the Hungarian language, complicated as it may be, pales in comparison to Armenian and especially Georgian. <laughs> Also, since 2015, announcements in English, either written or spoken, started to emerge even on apparently res less relevant metro and bus lines. Speaking of the metro, Budapest has them all. If you want to see Soviet-style metros, you take the M3. If you want a 19th century atmosphere with old world uh, stations, you take the M1. If you want 21st century autopilot subways, you take the M4. And if you want the normal metro experience, like you can find in Warsaw or Bucharest, you take the M2. Learning the metro network is very useful because it is cheap, reliable, works for almost 20 hours a day and is replaced by night buses and covers 98% of what is of relevance for any kind of visitors, uh, whether you're in transit, a tourist, a business visitor or a worker. Almost anything you might need is within walking distance from a metro station. So with that said, I'll have to save it for another time to show you the tax museum, which I missed it by 10 minutes in the last day, and the biggest synagogue in Europe, which, as I said, was sold out for the day, and uh, uh, for the day I had the time to visit it. Mind you, this video is not exhaustive. There are many other things in Budapest that are simply not of interest to me, and I also didn't promise to show in this tour. This city is one in which it is unlikely to get bored, especially during summertime. There are tons of festivals, concerts, nightclubs, open-air nightclubs, open-air concerts on the islands, and yes, Budapest has islands on the Danube, and other activities which I won't mention here for discretion reasons. So with all of that being said, I boarded the flight to Kutaisi late in the night and sent my clock two hours ahead to Samara time, which is used in Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. If I had traveled during winter, I would have had to set the clock three hours ahead because the Caucasus doesn't do this nonsense of moving its clock forwards and backwards twice a year. 
So, I'll see you soon with an episode covering Kutaisi and the surrounding areas. This, there is a lot more to be shown, and while it takes time to put them all together, we will do it. But until then, thank you all for watching, thank you to all of those who donated to support this tour, thank you all for your continuous and generous support, and um, I'll see you all soon on Freedom Alternative. <laughs>